Good morning and welcome to Volwalker Hall, the Stephen L. Anderson Design Center, the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design. My name is Peter McKeith, the Dean of the Faye Jones School. It's my privilege again today here in Fayetteville uh, to serve as our symposium's guide for the weekend's events. Uh, many, I know, in this room were also in Bentonville at record uh, yesterday afternoon uh, when we heard keynote presentations and discussion from Sean Donovan and from uh, Darren Walker. And this morning and this afternoon, we propose to carry those conversations and those discussions further into hopefully a level of detail, but also a level of proposed action. I'll be a bit repetitive uh, this morning for the sake of those who weren't able to attend yesterday as we get started. Uh, but I'll also uh, try to uh, propose a summary of what we heard from uh, Sean Donovan and from Darren Walker as we get started. Let's begin, as I uh, began yesterday, and perhaps more appropriately on a Sunday morning with an invocation and a challenge. And my invocation for those who are checking references is from my mentor in Finnish architecture culture, Alvaralto, who uh, proposes that architecture may not be able to save the world, but perhaps it can set the world a small example. And here's the challenge, again, that of accessible, affordable, and attainable housing, announced on the one hand as an issue of national importance last week by the annual Menino Survey of Mayors, in which a majority of the nation's mayors indicated that their primary concern was a lack of such housing in their cities and, on the other hand, announced last week here in Northwest Arkansas as an issue for us through a study compiled by the Center for Business and Economic Research at the Walton College of Business, indicating a need for more accessible housing options in Benton and Washington counties. Housing Northwest Arkansas is an initiative led by the university and this school and made possible by a grant from the Walton Family Foundation. And as we begin, I'd like to again express my gratitude to the Walton Family Foundation for our partnership and for their support and for our shared belief in the potentials of architecture and design to address these challenges. The Housing Northwest Arkansas Initiative includes an advanced design studio focused on the education of students, a regional symposium focused on the education of the community, and a professional design competition focused on the tangible realization of the ideas explored through these educational efforts into a productive reality. The design studio began here in the school three weeks ago under the guidance of visiting Professor Ann Fujiron from San Francisco together with Kent McDonald of Cal uh, Poly SLO, and I believe Anne and Kent are here. Could you raise your hands, Anne and Kent? <laughs> Hard to see you back there. They are back there, upper right. Please, uh, during our breaks, make sure to introduce yourselves to them, those from the community. They are here uh, for a significant period of time throughout this semester, and they are working with our head and professor of interior design, Carl Matthews, and our clinical professor of architecture, Allison Turner, and 25 students in fourth and fifth year on uh, housing design issues and housing design proposals. And that there will be more information forthcoming through our website as the semester progresses. The design competition is in uh, process now of, of refining the RFQ and refining the competition guidelines. More will be announced on that on March 1st. We're pleased to work in this effort with Reed Kroloff of Jones Kroloff, uh, who has been a significant or competition advisor to many significant competitions, including that of the High Line in New York. Reed, if you are here, could you raise your hand? Um, there we are. Next to Ann Fujiron. Again, uh, those of you from the community, if uh, you have uh, suggestions, perhaps, advice to provide us all in that competition process, don't hesitate to seek Reed out at the breaks. But each of these three components adds to the in-depth exploration of national and regional housing issues of design, zoning, finance, city planning, community development, and community education and engagement. This weekend's symposium already has included presentations by national experts 
and a series of public presentations and moderated discussions in housing policy, finances, design, development, and construction occurring today. The symposium aims to, intent, aims to provide participants with an overview of issues and challenges in attainable, affordable, and mixed-use housing. I'll alert all present to our desire for your participation today here in active discussion and also on social media through the channels shown here. I'll take a moment for people to note down those all-important hashtag addresses. Now yesterday, we uh, heard uh, first a presentation by Sean Donovan and then uh, a conversation with Sean Donovan and Darren Walker and then uh, questions uh, across a range of issues. Their presentations together with the conversations that occurred uh, prior to the, that public uh, presentation uh, with many of our panelists here and others from the community emphasized four particular issues. And I want to note these as we get started here today that we are moving from the general observations of yesterday to more specific observations today. What was noted uh, as I heard it and I, as I've talked with others who uh, were present were four issues or four directions for us to be focused on today and into the future. The first one is the question or the uh, importance of leadership. I think the challenge was placed to all of us to understand ourselves as design leaders, as people with voices, uh, with perspectives, with backgrounds, with experiences, with talents and skills that can be brought to bear upon this critical issue. A second issue was inclusiveness. How can we as a community bring together stakeholders and all of these many voices, all of these uh, many talents and skills and perspectives and experiences into at least, if at all possible, a regional understanding of what we value in our quality of life, what we value, therefore, in the housing that we provide, in the housing that we occupy. A third challenge to us was how to innovate relative to where we are relative to our sense of community and relative to the leadership roles that, again, we're all challenged to take on. And the fourth issue is, was that of authenticity. How can we, through leadership, through building of community, through innovative work, remain true to ourselves, true to the character of this region, uh, to its history, but also to its future. And this is perhaps uh, where we uh, begin today with a more precise understanding uh, uh, through uh, perspectives offered uh, here in the school by, on the one hand, uh, Stephen Luoni, who is the Stephen L. Anderson Professor of Architecture and Urban Studies and the director of our Community Design Center, working together with Matthew Petty, who's Fayetteville Alderman and also uh, developer and developer educator working across the country in the uh, Incremental Housing Alliance. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, a presentation by uh, Steve and by uh, Matt uh, and then continue forward from that uh, across the day through three presentations, paired presentations in fact, of, of uh, national experts we'll say, uh, uh, to uh, present to us case studies best practices as they've uh, come to work in them, uh, and then to engage those presenters with local community panelists uh, in which your participation from the audience will be important uh, so that we can begin this back and forth dialogue between national perspectives and local and community perspectives. So begin to tease out these issues along the lines of leadership, innovation, um, inclusiveness, and authenticity. That's our format. You can follow it in the program. We will uh, hear from Steve and Matt first, go directly into our first set of paired presentations, and then a panel moderated by our director of the University of Arkansas Resiliency Center, Marty Macklot. We'll take a break for lunch, come back, and do that process twice more before wrapping up at the end of the afternoon with uh, remarks and a reception. 
So at this point, again, I'd like to welcome you all, welcome our guests, uh, as well as our students and my colleagues here uh, for the morning and for the afternoon, and now welcome uh, Steve Luoni and Matthew Petty. Let's get started. Well, good morning, good morning, and welcome to uh, day two of the housing symposium. I'll start by laying out four national issues regarding housing, and particularly affordable housing, uh, that uh, while they have a, a national impact, I'll talk about their impact on local issues, uh, touching upon Northwest Arkansas. Matthew will follow up with uh, policy suggestions and drill down deeper into um, public sector issues on uh, housing supply and housing development. The first issue I want to bring up is measuring affordability, and this is a reiteration of what was um, discussed yesterday. But a conventional gauge of affordability says that no more than 30% of your household income should be devoted to housing. However, a more comprehensive gauge of affordability is something called the Housing Plus Transportation Affordability Index, which was pioneered by the Center for Neighborhood Technology. What the H plus T study says is that no more than 45% of a household income uh, should be spent on a combination of housing and transportation cost. Their 2011 study for Northwest Arkansas showed that while uh, the average household spent 26% uh, of its income on housing, it spent 29% of its income on transportation. That's 55%. That's well above the 45% threshold for affordability. So whereas our average household income spent 29% on transportation, the national average is 19%. And in rail cities, uh, cities served by streetcar, light rail, commuter rail, subway, uh, the average household income spent 12% on transportation costs. So getting a transportation system right is a prosperity building program and a way to affordability. The same study showed that in 2000, 80% of Northwest Arkansas households lived in neighborhoods with affordable housing costs at or below 30%. But when you add transportation costs, only 10% of our households lived in neighborhoods that were under the 45% threshold. So this suggests that housing affordability needs to be triangulated with land use and it needs to be triangulated with transportation. And in order to solve for each of those three, in order to get the transit right, in order to get the land use right, housing needs to be part of it. And right now, and it's something to think about throughout the day, at the level of the region, at the level of the city, and the level of the region, uh, neither public sector has strategically connected the dots between the three uh, transportation, housing, and land use. The second theme is the financialization of housing. In addition to shelter now, housing is seen as a vehicle to generate wealth subject to the demand of an investor class, whether it's a homeowner seeking an equity loan, seeking a loan to start a new business, whether it's a, a global investor um, investing in secure, securitized mortgages, a second home investor uh, a land speculator. This is all part of uh, a class of investors that is really driving up housing cost. And so it really commodifies housing. And the big question, I think, for today are what, what are some strategies to decommodify housing? The problem with housing as a commodity is that it raises housing cost above the consumer price index, above the CPI. So, for instance, in northwest Arkansas in 2016, uh, the average house price rose 7 percent, whereas the CPI and wages only rose 2 percent. There are a couple issues per pertinent to the region that drive this uh, unevenness. Uh, we're a high growth region. We're growing at, especially over the last 10 years, growing at close to 3 percent annually. So land speculation is part of that growth. That comes naturally with high growth markets. For instance, down, uh, downtown Fayetteville, which is a uni growing university, public university town, experiences a ton of land speculation, but also it is an active second home investor market. 
Uh, our con some of our condominium prices exceed $400 a square foot. Uh, the average downtown housing price is $250 a square foot in a city where the average housing is selling for $100 a square foot. Now, to our out-of-town investors, that seems uh, amazingly and wonderfully cheap. But keep in mind uh, that the average household income in Fayetteville is $39,000, which means they can afford about $100 a square foot. This is in a state where the average household income is somewhere in the mid-40s. Downtown revitalization also in Bentonville, uh, particularly Bentonville and Fayetteville, are producing gentrification effects. And that comes from the success of uh, corporations here, the Fortune 500 companies, Tyson, uh, Walmart, and Hunt, as well as their vendor communities, have attracted a high-income workforce uh, from the outside, an international workforce that brings a different salary structure to the region. So it's creating amazing unevenness. Uh, for instance, in downtown Bentonville, the current median listing price for a house or for a dwelling unit is touching $400,000. Three years ago, it was a third that. Uh, so gentrification and land speculation is uh, generating uh, massive unevenness. And this was a statistic that was cited yesterday, but I'll reiterate it. Uh, Northwest Arkansas is the most unequal metro area in Arkansas. The top 1% make 33 times more than the bottom 99%. The national average is 25 times. Uh, so we're a third above that in rising. What this does, it not only skews the housing market to provide for the middle and upper income market, uh, and what it does is uh, it leaves incredible supply gaps, even and not just at the affordable level, but the attainable level and the lower uh, middle market rate housing market. So this brings us to a third theme, is government and nonprofit involvement in housing supply. And you start with this question, to what extent is housing seen as a public good? And so similar to the dynamics over access to health care and higher education, Supply gaps in housing have traditionally, at least since World War II, or World War I, have been filled by the public sector. However, this region's public sector, its housing authorities, and even its nonprofit housing suppliers of, of, of the ones that do exist, have been relatively inactive for the last generation, for the last 20 years. And even the private market can't keep up with the housing demand. Uh, we're growing at the rate of 12,000 people annually, which means we'll require 8,000 new units over the next three years, and we're only building 1,000 units. Uh, so we're radically undersupplied, even at the level of the uh, market rate housing. In the rental market, we'll need close, to, over the next three years, in the rental market, we'll need close to 5,000 units. Uh, currently, 1,500 are under construction. Again, we're radically undersupplied. The vacancy rate in Northwest Arkansas for housing is 0.39%, and in downtowns currently, it's effectively 0%. There's simply no supply available. A healthy vacancy rate for a region for a housing market is around 6 to 7%. Uh, that means 93% occupancy. So you know, back to this notion of uh, local NGOs and local housing authorities, uh, th this is one thing to think about today. How to how to introduce a new level of innovation and purposefulness and entrepreneurship to housing authorities, to uh, affordable housing supplier. We do have one in Arkansas that I think is a role model for entrepreneurship and innovation, and that's the Fort Smith Housing Authority. And the Fort Smith Housing Authority has become a vertically integrated uh, organization that, in addition to being an affordable housing supplier, also has a development division which, who, whose mission is the creation of economic development, and they also have a construction division. Uh, so this is an authority that, that sees the entire Fort Smith area as a unified housing market, and they're now involved in the provision of affordable housing, attainable housing, and soon market rate housing. Uh, they're also uh, involved in urban uh, planning projects for downtown Fort Smith. So they look at urban design in support of housing. This is an authority uh, that has evolved out of the model of scarcity that has plagued our housing authorities, and I think uh, they're a, a remarkable organization to look at for what the public sector 
once did and can do again. The fourth theme I want to conclude with is missing middle housing types. Uh, this is a class of architecture, a class of multifamily walk-up housing types that we're all familiar with, townhouses, courtyard housing, bungalow houses, uh, mansion apartment, duplexes, fourplexes, you know, and, and it's also regional, you know, the, Los Angeles has the Dingbat, uh, uh, Boston has the uh, Triple Decker, um, and so there's an array, including live work, there's an array of housing types that we haven't built since the 1940s, uh, because their uh, uh, city regulations have thrown obstacles uh, to this type of housing. Uh, also, financing at some points have been a problem for achieving this housing product. This is superior housing product and arguably the primary vector for achieving affordability. This is a housing type that was diverse, that accommodated a full range of incomes in one place, that were in walkable neighborhoods, and that were supported by an array of, of superior public space amenities. Uh, but this is not the type of housing we built now. What we're building is something uh, at, at both ends of the scale. We're building single family. It's easy to get a loan for single family. And it's, and it's not that hard to get a loan for uh, uh, large scale apartment complexes. And, and most of the complexes that we're familiar with are uh, large scale flats built on a podium over, over parking. Uh, and really it requires large agglomerations of space in downtown to do. So I, I would contend, uh, I think it's an arguable position that we need to think about, that missing middle housing is uh, uh, one primary vector for building walkable urban communities with affordable housing as well as other types of housing mixed in. I think what we need is uh, public sector leadership in, in all of the downtowns here to green light that housing, uh, to figure out a way to not only have a downtown plan, it's not enough to have a downtown plan. That downtown plan needs to be incented to get to the uh, development that you want to see. So the next step is incenting those, those downtown plans. And that probably means that the city has to become uh, more of a develop, developer in getting the development it's looking for. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Matthew. Thank you, Steve. Thank you again for coming for day two. I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, the policy areas for addressing uh, affordability and attainability. And uh, in general, whenever we look at policies for affordability and attainability across the country, we see that they fall into four areas. Um, at least three of these I think you'll all be very familiar with. First, uh, we see policies that um, create or preserve affordable units. These are uh, policies uh, that impact uh, this issue at the project level. So, for example, your HUD loans, pre-development financing or, or pre-development cost abatement, uh, those funds might be provided by a, a foundation or, uh, or another nonprofit. Or, um, for example, housing trust funds, which are used to create and develop affordable units. The key definition here is uh, that we are looking at subsidies at the project level. Second, also familiar, we, we see policies that uh, subsidize uh, households. So, for example, a, a voucher program uh, or policies that uh, help to improve access uh, to other households like fair housing laws. These are policies that are applied at the, at the household level, different from the project level, but just as important. Third, we see a, a set of policies that focus on improving the stability and the quality of housing in the region. For example, we might provide financial or legal assistance to struggling households to prevent evictions. Or we might provide foreclosure assistance or neighborhood stabilization funds so that neighborhoods don't fall into disrepair and lead to a runaway condition. All three of these policies, and there's a fourth that I haven't described yet, go to what we might refer to as affordable housing with an uppercase A at the beginning of it. It's what we're very familiar with talking about whenever we discuss the crisis in other parts of the country like Seattle or San Francisco or New York, these are typically the kinds of policy solutions that we read about in the news and that we study. And I'm describing them to you today because I want you to understand that as we consider these challenges in Northwest Arkansas, it's important for us to recognize that 
All three categories of policies are important for us to consider and to evaluate what we might implement here. It would be uh, convenient for us to look at a successful policy example, a case study from another community, and conclude that if we could only duplicate their efforts, we might enjoy the same success. But in fact, the challenges that we face uh, present a problem that exists at such a scale that we would not be able to address these challenges if we don't look at all three policy areas. But there's actually this fourth area, which might be even more impactful and more important. And this goes to the idea of workforce housing or attainable housing generally for the population. And in fact, if we don't figure out how to increase the overall supply, we are worsening the conditions in a way that uh, we may not ever to be, we, we may not ever solve. If we look at um, Historic growth rates, uh, households in Northwest Arkansas, to put this in a very local context. From 2000 to 2010, we increased the number of households available for residents here at a rate of about 3.5%. If we were to continue that rate of production forward from today, between now and 2030, we would produce, uh, in loose numbers, about 140,000 new units in the next 12 years. That number was shocking to me whenever I first uh, did the projection because I know how many households we've been producing in the last four or five years and in no way are we keeping up with that projection. In no way are we keeping up with the rate of population growth that we have. If we are to continue to grow at the rate that we have been growing because we are such an attractive community and we have such large numbers of people who are migrating into our community, we will need every single one of those units to preserve the pricing levels that we have today. And this is very simple. If you have a lower supply uh, than what is demanded, households of higher incomes will compete with and outbid households of more modest incomes. This is an age-old principle of supply and demand, right? You have a particular demand for housing, and if that is, uh, if the supply exists at a certain price and we are oversupplied, then prices come down. If supply exists at a certain price and we are undersupplied, prices come up. If we have a situation as we do in Northwest Arkansas, this unique condition where we have such an attractive region that is growing so quickly, where demand is actually increasing at the same time as we increase supply, we end up with a scenario where we may never catch up. That's why it's very important for us to talk about how can we provision new policies and new programs so that we can increase the overall supply of even market rate housing so that this condition doesn't run away from us. I don't mean to uh, trivialize the need for uh, uppercase A affordable programs. The homeless, homeless population in the last 10 years more than doubled. Uh, it increased by a factor of 140% or so. Most of the increase in the homeless population uh, is with households, parents with children. And most of them are finding shelter if they're able to find shelter by doubling up with friends and family. And so people are making housing choices today that they wouldn't have 10 years ago. And they're choosing uh, lower quality housing uh, out of necessity. It's a real problem. At the same time, we know that because we are critically undersupplied with market rate housing, households of more modest means are being forced to choose, again, lower quality housing than they would have uh, in the past. And this is reflected in the political conditions of our time. Uh, as a politician, I know that um, one of the biggest uh, concerns and complaints I hear from my constituents in Fayetteville is that uh, people have a fear that they are going to be priced out of the neighborhoods that they have lived in for decades and come to love. Those neighborhoods are a part of their identities, and their identities are a part of what makes the region what it is today and what makes it so attractive. So addressing the supply and demand problem becomes, I think, the critical feature and I think is the major touchstone for our panelists today and for our conversations uh, during the break. It's a complicated issue. The recession didn't just crash housing prices. It also crashed a construction labor market. 
Northwest Arkansas and Arkansas in general is blessed with one of the best labor markets uh, in the country. And that's because we have a history of uh, relative to the rest of the country respect, respecting uh, working class families and the jobs that they might hold. But even still, we are experiencing the same kinds of pressures in the labor market that the rest of the country has. And although we are producing homes at about the same uh, rate of production as we saw in 2005 prior to the recession, we're doing so with a labor market that is relatively inexperienced. In addition to labor market complications, uh, delivering the kinds of housing that Steve talked about, missing mi middle housing, is harder because there are not standard financial products that are available to developers that want to produce that kind of housing. There are standard financial projects for single family homes, whether those are at the individual or at the subdivision level. And there are standard financial projects for large scale developments. But there are no standard financial projects for missing middle projects, which are usually treated much the same as their large scale counterparts in terms of uh, credit analysis uh, by the banks. This is a problem because with a large-scale development and 100 or more units, you can amortize those costs across a large number of units, and it doesn't have so much of an impact to the end user in terms of their rents. But if I have to pay the same legal fees to produce an eight-unit apartment complex as I do to produce a 100-unit apartment complex, it makes the calculation much different, and I have to charge a rent to make up the difference. Perhaps most importantly, besides the labor market and, uh, and the financing arena, are, are local land use and zoning policies. I was talking to uh, my contractor uh, a few weeks ago, and he was telling me a war story. And he said uh, he was working in a, in a city when he was younger, and they just implemented a brand new program to do conceptual reviews. They really wanted developers to come in and talk to them about their projects before they paid the engineers before they went to hard line and actually spent the money so that they could steer them towards what they wanted. And they said to my contractor, they said, um, the policy is it's $1,000 for the conceptual review and you can submit three questions in advance and we'll do our best to answer those. And he says, well, $1,000, that seems like a lot of money. And they say, yeah, it does. What are your other two questions? Not a true story. <laughs> it's funny because it's a familiar depiction of the way we treat our land use and zoning policies and practices. Um, not just in Northwest Arkansas, but across the country. This isn't a unique experience for us. And although I think we have led um, the conversation in many ways nationally in uh, calling for reforms for our land use and zoning policies and Im even implementing some of them, it's still the case that our policies distort the market towards delivery of projects at a scale that uh, un continues to undersupply relative to the demand that we have. With the Downtown Vitality Report that was just released by the Walton Family Foundation just earlier this week, we saw uh, counts of how many units had, had been produced in each of the downtowns uh, in the last five or six years. And the numbers ranged from a couple of dozen to uh, between one and 200 in each of the downtowns. And it would be convenient for us to look at this and look at the relative housing prices and the rates of absorption, which have been very quick in all of the downtowns, and conclude that we are doing our jobs, that the downtowns are uh, showing extraordinary vitality and that uh, we are responding to market conditions. But in fact, those properties are priced so high and the prices are escalating so quickly and those properties are closing so quickly because demand is not being met because of the mismatch. The numbers of units that we produced in downtowns in the last five or six years are relatively rounding errors compared to the need that we have in the region. If we were to produce again at the same rates we did prior to the recession and to actually build those 140,000 units, we would have to produce units at a rate of about 10 times, eight to 10 times of what we're producing today. And our policies are a big part of that. Now we're gonna go into uh, a lot of these factors and touch back on a lot of these things with the panelists today, so I'm not gonna go any, into more detail there. I wanna leave you with this. We heard yesterday 
from the Family Foundation as they talked about this study, that our downtowns are becoming increasingly accessible only to households of high income. I think we're fortunate in Northwest Arkansas that we're having this conversation now. We have seen this scenario play out across the country and other regions where uh, if anyone raised the issue prior to their challenges becoming manifest, they didn't do anything. We have convened all of the right leaders and decision makers and thinkers in this room today who can address this issue and scope the, scope the solutions going forward. The future is not yet here. And I want to challenge you, and I want to challenge the, pal the, the panelists today to help us imagine a future where if we can address construction challenges, financing challenges, and our policy challenges together, that we might be able to build a future for Northwest Arkansas that is inclusive for everyone and, uh, and puts the housing where they want it. Thank you. What a great start. Thank you. You'll see Matthew and Steve again as they moderate the case studies this afternoon after lunch. Again, I'm Marty Matlock. I'm introducing our first case study. So we're going to jump right in. Now, you have the annex to the schedule you, uh, that has the bios of the speakers. In the interest of giving our speakers more time, I'm not going to read the bios to you, though, in my class. That's typically what I end up doing. Uh, but I will abbreviate them. Garner Stoll is our first presenter in, in, the, in this first uh, case study. Uh, he's Director of Development Services for the City of Fayetteville. Uh, he, was a, he led the, or participated in leading the Imagine Austin program with the City of Austin uh, and has had a number of experiences around the region as a, a city director of development, uh, community development, including Boulder, Colorado, Lincoln, Nebraska, Lawrence, Kansas, and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Garner earned a master's degree in regional and city planning and a bachelor's degree in anthropology from both, uh, both from the University of Oklahoma. I'm an eighth generation Okie, so... Um, we, we only disagree when Oklahoma State and OU play. Uh, and then uh, in keeping with the, the strategy we used with the previous session, we'll, uh, as when Garner concludes, Lisa will come on up immediately. Uh, Lisa Sturdivant has been involved in research and analysis for 15 years. Um, uh, Dr. Sturdivant has uh, serves as president of Lisa Sturdivant and Associates. Uh, I'm going to read this part because it's impressive, where she provides insightful, high-quality analysis for local governments, nonprofits, organizations, and private sector clients. And she really does target uh, in her professional practice the issues that the challenges that Matthew just issued for us. Uh, she's had a number of positions, vice president for research at the National Housing Conference and associate research professor and de deputy director for the Center for Regional Analysis at George Mason University School of Public Policy in Virginia, among others. Uh, Dr. Sturdivant earned a PhD in public policy from George Mason University, a master's degree in public policy from the University of Maryland, and a BS in mathematical economics from Wake Forest University. We're very excited to have you here. Come on up, Garner. Good morning, everybody. Uh, might need some technical help here. <laughs> While they're figuring that out. Um, I thought about... Uh, Yes. Okay. It's it's loaded. Yeah. That will need to switch over to it. I'll get started. Um, I moved here from Austin, Texas last year. So uh, how y'all doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great to see so many people this early on a Sunday morning, giving your weekend. I had thought, second thoughts when I was invited to participate in this panel, but after yesterday and this morning, 
Uh, it's just been a great experience, and I look forward to uh, uh, contributing to it. Um, I was working for the city of uh, Austin, Texas. Um, when I got there, they hadn't done a new plan in, in uh, That better? They hadn't done a new, new comprehensive plan in 30 years. They, tr they tried twice and failed. And so that was part of my portfolio. Uh, why I was recruited to Austin was to do a new, new comprehensive plan. And we went through an extensive three-year process. I used to joke uh, that it was planning with 18,000 friends. Um, it was adopted in uh, 2012. It uh, launched a number of initiatives. Uh, the um, moniker of the plan was to create a compact and connected Austin. Uh, Mayor Leffingwell initiated a project to uh, fund a, starting, a start of a fixed rail project, um, which didn't succeed. Uh, the mayor that followed him, Mayor Adler, who's the present mayor, uh, led an effort to uh, do a three-quarters of a billion dollar infrastructure plan that will rebuild all the transit corridors, virtually all the transit corridors in more walkable, transit-friendly manner. Um, a large project was started. I was working on it for a couple of years after the plan was adopted to do a new, new land use code and um, completely remap uh, all of Austin uh, according, accordingly after we create a new uh, land use code. I chose not to talk about that project because it's uh, deeply high centered in Austin NIMBY land right now. Uh, it's millions of dollars into the project, great consultants, great work was done. Um, but um, Austin likes to get into the details. Uh, I think they eventually will adopt it, but it's taking a while. So I thought I'd, I'd talk about the fourth initiative, which is directly related to our discussion, which is Austin's Attainable Housing Blueprint. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. I'm gonna uh, introduce the strategies in the blueprint, and then I'm gonna try to uh, organize them in terms of how they might be applicable to Northwest Arkansas. Uh, because of the nature of uh, each one of these strategies could, could take 20 minutes. So please, uh, somebody uh, watch the clock. I do not want to borrow from Lisa or the question and answer period. And uh, it's, uh, Stephanie, it's arranged so I can sprint to the end. So background, uh, Austin is experiencing sustained and rapid growth. It's been going on for decades. It's about 3% annually. Uh, 50,000 people come to Central Texas every year. About 25,000 of those um, in, in, end up in the city of Austin. Uh, Austin has a fantastic, uh, successful, resurgent downtown. Uh, all this is resulting in increased congestion, longer commute. Uh, Mr. Walker's comment yesterday is absolutely true. Uh, it's very difficult to get around in Austin um, during peak hour. Uh, Austin has a well-funded bus system, but the buses are stuck in the same traffic as everybody else. Um, Austin's political context, um, a saying about Austin is that it's a blueberry and a giant bowl of uh, tomato soup, which is true. Um, we used to say, uh, we're not in Texas, but we can see it on all sides. Uh, <laughs> so um, it, what this does is it creates an uneasy relationship with the legislature who, that meet there um, every other year. And also, Austin has an anemic uh, regional planning uh, program. Costs have been exceeding wages, study after study are done. Every time the study is done, the household income doesn't keep up with the cost of housing. So it's a, it's a, it's a problem that is, a, is expanding. So the, the blueprint says we really need 135,000 new housing units by 2025, and 60,000 of those uh, uh, should be uh, accessible or attainable 
or below 80% MFI. This is just a shot of what's happening in downtown. Um, the University of Texas, the downtown, uh, Town Lake, um, create this uh, wonderful, wonderful magnet. And everybody wants to be close to it, um, but there's no, there's no um, road capacity or uh, transit system to, uh, to serve it. So um, a guiding principle of uh, Imagine Austin was um, we want to view land use and transportation as the same so uh, as two sides of the same coin, and in fact, the uh, Imagine Austin element, uh, land use and transportation, are together as one element. So here are the strategies, and I won't. Uh, I'll go through them. I won't belabor them. Increase public funding. I would put on number number one. Austin has had uh, a lot of experience in this. They have two general obligation bonds, one of 60 million and one of 65 million. They produced about uh, 25 units of uh, income restricted housing and, and about four times that many units of um, uh, market rate housing. Of course, they use CDBG, they use TIF. Uh, Austin uses density bonuses because it can't legally do inclusionary zoning. Um, there are a lot of unintended consequences of, of that, but um, we can talk about that on the panel. Um, streamlined development approval fees. Uh, Austin had smart housing before the blueprint was developed, so that's an ongoing program. I think it contributes, but I don't know if it's a, a huge factor. Uh, Re remove regulatory uh, barriers, uh, grant additional entitlements to implement the new plan. That's the Code Next project. That's the one that's uh, high centered and it's running parallel with the, the blueprint. Um, but it, uh, it, it makes uh, ADUs by right throughout the city. It, it addresses the missing middle issues and mixed use zoning and so forth. Um, make public land available for housing. If there's any um, lesson that I, I think is a takeaway from Austin, it is, um, is this one. The Miller former airport site is now a large mixed use uh, community. Too successful, I would say. The market rate housing is going up rapidly, but it is 25%, the housing is 25% below 80% MFI. So it's, and they use tax increment fun, uh, financing and land right down. Uh, you can do things if you own the land that's hard to do um, otherwise. Uh, create land trusts. I think this has a lot of potential because as the public land is, is used, the land trust can be out there taking options and bringing more to the table. Uh, preventing displacement, retaining uh, existing housing stop. Um, I'm not going to use the uh, five-syllable G word today. I'd rather use displacement. Um, it's, it's a real issue. It's a big issue in Austin. I think it will be an issue in Fayetteville if it isn't already. Um, Austin uh, can use the heritage uh, tax law, which allows uh, certain districts to be created and the ad valorem taxes to be pre prevent from going up until the ownership changes. Um, but it's, it's a weak tool, and I don't think they're addressing displacement very well. The last one, uh, seeking legislation to allow inclusionary zoning and rent control, it's in the blueprint, but uh, when pigs can fly. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, Maybe I could launch our discussion, or maybe this would be useful if I'd uh, select my uh, top six uh, strategies for uh, Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I think make public land available for housing is number one. You can do it with a great deal of precision. You can do it with a, a great deal of fairness. Uh, and you can make the uh, uh, attainable housing long range, uh, the affordability can be many, many years. Uh, it reduces the value of the land. Um, and it meets one of the other goals which was discussed yesterday. 
I think the word, uh, academic word, intentionality was used. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it means on purpose. It, it's a good way to start that. Uh, remove regulatory barriers, uh, uh, allow alternative housing types. Um, Fayetteville and other communities, I think, have, have already done this to some extent, but there's still a lot left be, to be done. We're taking another look at our ADE ordinance. Uh, I know Fayetteville li allows tiny houses. Um, I see um, regulatory f reform, I, I see a good basis for it, but I think we just need to keep working on it. And if, if it's not being built, we need to ask the question, why isn't it being built, and propose alternatives and be bold. Uh, Public-private nonprofit partnerships, I think Lisa will talk about these. So, uh, increased public funding. Um, I know that sales tax are uh, high, uh, but the property tax ad valorem rates seem really, really low coming from Texas. So um, I think that's, that's a possibility. Uh, streamlined development uh, approvals, Matthew talked about this, it's always needed. And it's needed for whether, the, where you, whether you're doing it, uh, attainable housing or, or market rate housing or any other use. And finally, uh, the circle closes with create land trust. So uh, with that, do we go straight to Lisa? All right, thank you. Good morning. I'm probably going to ask for help, too, in finding the presentation. Um, yeah, thanks. That's me right there, right above his. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK. Thanks, uh, thanks again. And, uh, Thanks, Garner, for um, those introductory remarks and learning about Austin. And thank you uh, to everyone here for the chance to come and be with you today and to uh, share a little bit about um, some experiences from other parts of the country and also to learn from everybody, everybody here. You know, so one of the biggest challenges to ensuring that there's housing affordable to people of modest incomes um, is that the gap right, between the cost of building housing and the revenue generated by providing that housing at lower rents or prices often is difficult to meet. And the conditions of the housing market have a lot to do with that. So if you're in a place like Northwest Arkansas where there is a significant population growth where the place is attracting thousands of new residents and often those new residents have incomes that are higher than the existing residents and that gap is even harder to figure out how to close. So I'm going to talk about a few examples um, where lower cost housing has been produced either by strategies that have sought to reduce the overall cost of delivering housing or have made use of partnerships among the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector uh, in order to facilitate the development of housing sort of writ large but with targeting folks who make lower and uh, more moderate incomes. You know, I want to pick up on something Peter said though that um, you know, this idea of authenticity is really important. And so the, the purpose of showing these examples is not to say, well, this is how you should do it here, but rather this is how it has been done. And are there ideas here that fit in with the organizational capacity and the principles and the values and the, the goals of the work that's being done here um, in Northwest Arkansas? So just um, quickly by way of introduction, uh, Marty introduced uh, me before, but uh, I am with the Urban Land Institute and the Terwilliger Center for Housing uh, does research and provides best practices around workforce and affordable housing issues. Uh, I also uh, work as a consultant with local communities, developers, local governments to assess housing needs and to do work on housing policy and planning. So I'm going to start with this graphic. This is a graphic from the Urban Institute. Um, which is different than the Urban Land Institute, just to avoid confusion. But it's, it's uh, an app, it's, a, it's an online uh, little program you can go into and play around with, and it shows the cost of delivering housing and then what the revenue would be generated if you offered that housing, in this case, to families earning 30% 
of the area median income. So the picture on the right shows the cost of producing a 100-unit apartment building in this case uh, and wanting to produce that at uh, an income uh, to families who can afford uh, incomes if they have 30% of the area median income. And uh, the, the picture on the right shows the development cost even with the low income housing tax credit providing a subsidy to the project. But that remaining gap suggests that this project in particular, particular doesn't pencil out and so it's not going to get built. Right? Nobody's going to step in and build it if that gap remains. And this online app allows you to play around with different scenarios to figure out how that gap might be closed um, in different ways, in different types of communities. And so, you know, we start thinking about, well, what drives this cost? And um, we talked a little bit about uh, the cost of materials, but the cost of labor in particular. Uh, a labor, a shortage of labor uh, means that the cost of providing labor is uh, on the rise. The cost of land, which I'll come back to. And then there's other drivers, including the scale and the density allowed, the architectural and other requirements, uh, financial requirements, um, but then there's also state and local regulations that drive the cost of development, and we talked, touched on um, zoning and land use, and I'll come back to that in a bit. So I'm going to highlight a few projects that have worked to um, reduce some of these costs in different ways. And the case studies that I'm going to present are focused primarily in Virginia, and, but they're all available on the Urban Land In Institute's website. I can also direct you to the communities themselves if you're interested. So I'm going to start with, um, this is Chatham Square. This is located in the city of Alexandria, Virginia, in the historic district. And it's an example of what was an innovative, but what ended up being a replicated partnership between the local housing authority and a for-profit developer. So Chatham Square came about because the city wanted to redevelop one of its public housing buildings on a two-block site. And so it demolished 100 units of public housing and issued an RFP. EYA, a regional for-profit developer, uh, submitted a proposal and was accepted and was awarded the proposal. Uh, so Chatham Square has 100 market rate townhomes uh, side by side with 52 uh, public housing units affordable at 30% AMI. The remaining 48 public housing units, because the city has a one-for-one -one replacement policy, were developed in scatter sites in other parts of the city. So EYA actually bought the land. Now, I'm gonna, land is going to end up being important here, and so I'm glad that, Garn, that you mentioned the role of land. EYA bought the land. The housing authority sold the land to the private developer, and they paid about 150% of the market value for the land, and that allowed the housing authority to redevelop the public housing units and to support other programs. Uh, the development was approved for somewhat higher densities, and importantly, um, particularly maybe for this audience, design was really important in this project. Can you see the public housing units in this project? So the public housing units are visually indistinguishable from the market rate townhomes. Uh, they're side by side. They look like townhomes from the outside, but there's actually two doors, and each townhouse uh, is split into two apartments. And so this idea of, this is in a neighborhood where million dollar historic homes sit right adjacent to this property. So it was really important to focus on design and um, they really are indistinguishable from one another. So one of, some of the lessons learned, because this was a new type of partnership for the housing authority in the city, there was actually a fear that people wouldn't buy a townhouse next to public housing. Uh, people camped out to buy townhouses next to, to buy these townhouses next to public housing. This was in 2004, and the region's housing market was really on, uh, on the upswing, and people pitched their tents. The city had to come and tell them, no, we're gonna give you a lottery number, come back in the morning, we don't want you sleeping on the street, to buy townhouses next to the public housing. So, um, in fact, the developer made more money on the market rate townhomes than they, suggest, than they expected, and so through an agreement, they provided a portion of that extra revenue back to the housing authority, which supported more programs. So the potential displacement was also a concern, and so the housing authority worked very closely with residents to make sure they were ready to come back to the units since they got first crack at the units that were being developed. And this partnership was uh, so successful that uh, the city has worked with EYA to develop, uh, redevelop more public housing sites to accommodate both affordable workforce and public housing within one, uh, one development. So I'm going to talk about another example of a partner, a 
a partnership this time between uh, Arlington County, Virginia government and a nonprofit developer. So this is a, an apartment building on the left that was built adjacent to the redevelopment of a new community center. The community center is that glass building on the right. You can see the apartments are located right behind it. And so, you know, the key partnership was between the county and the developer because the county owned this land, again, this land, right, that had a community center on it that was aging, they wanted to redevelop it, and they, but they saw the potential to do something more than just rebuild the community center. They said, what if we increase the density, what if we change the zoning, and what if we found a partner? And then we could build housing as part of the, re the entire redevelopment effort. So the county provided the land to, the, uh, to APA, which is a nonprofit developer, for a significantly below market rate uh, cost, below market cost. And then uh, APA was able to build 122 units of housing affordable to moderate income, low income families, including 13 units of permanent supportive housing uh, for extremely low income individuals who are transitioning from homelessness. They couldn't have done that had it not been for the, land, the subsidy that came in the form of land. The county also uh, uh, shared parking structures. So uh, there's a shared parking facility for the community center and the housing. So the developer didn't have to build as much housing, which also meant that the cost of developing the housing was lowered. And so I, I can't uh, overstate the value of having the community center adjacent to this new housing and the fact that the residents can take advantage of the community center, the programs, and all the other things offered on site. So some of the lessons learned was this discounted land was critical to being able to produce housing that was affordable at rents that were significantly below what market rents were at the time. In-kind subsidies may be more beneficial to some projects than financial resources, which is good when financial resources are, are limited. Uh, Arlington County, Virginia actually has a pretty generous local housing trust fund and funds a lot of affordable housing. They put zero dollars from the housing trust fund into this project. The entire subsidy was the land, the shared parking infrastructure, and other support related to the development approval process that made this project possible. Uh, it can also be a catalyst. This was one of the first projects as part of the redevelopment of this corridor within Arlington County, Virginia, and really set a high bar for this public, uh, nonprofit, private partnership um, that really came to follow uh, throughout the rest of the, the uh, Columbia Pike Corridor. The last uh, project example I want to mention, uh, since we are here at uh, the university, is uh, an example of employer-assisted housing that was a partnership this time between a university and the local economic development authority. Not the housing authority, not the government, the EDA. Uh, worked together um, with George Mason uh, University, my alma mater, uh, and where I work, so I um, uh, feel particularly tied to this project. But George Mason was increasingly having trouble attracting faculty and staff and even graduate students to its campus because of the high cost of housing in the Northern Virginia suburbs. And so the university also had excess land. Ah, land comes up again as being really important. So they decided to figure out how to build housing so that new faculty, new staff, new students uh, could come and then ultimately be sort of a recruiting tool. So Masonvale is 157 units, and it's all rental housing. The idea was to help attract people to the community and then uh, so that they would ultimately get themselves established and maybe move on to home ownership or other housing thus freeing up housing for the next new wave of recruitments. And so as a state institution, George Mason didn't have to go through local zoning and development approval processes, but they did have to go to the state. And the state has a lot of say over what you build on college campuses. And college campuses build dorms, but they don't build rental housing necessarily. And so there was a lot of learning curve that had to happen uh, for this particular partnership. And the university developed a new entity. The university is not a housing developer. So they developed a new entity that would be responsible for developing, owning, and managing the housing. And they, uh, it was a ground lease situation that this entity paid to the university. So the university retained ownership over, over the land. The nonprofit entity, um, MHI, was able to finance the project with nearly $40 million in tax-exempt bonds issued by the Economic Development Authority. And the EDA made, uh, issued the bonds solely on the basis of the university's demonstrated need for housing and their role as a key employer in the community, an important uh, civic organization in the community. 
So this has been a great re recruiting tool for George Mason. Um, it's also created a sense of community. The university had been largely sort of a, a commuter campus, um, and so having more people on campus and near campus created more of a sense of community. In 2006, George Mason's men's basketball team made the 2006 uh, Division I Final Four basketball championship, and the media came on campus, and they were trying to find students in a pep rally, and they couldn't find big groups of people because it wasn't a place where people were congregating. And so the sense of community has really been um, a, an important benefit of Masonvale. And then they did realize that this special purpose entity put in place to do the development and manage and operate the housing was really important since they didn't want to take on that specialized expertise on their own. So I'm going to end just with uh, one last um, uh, example related to inclusionary housing. Garner mentioned inclusionary zoning in Austin. Inclusionary uh, housing, as you may know, is a policy that links the development of market rate housing to the provision of housing that's offered below market rents and prices. And these policies are generally codified in a locality zoning ordinance, which is why it's called inclusionary zoning. And these types of policies are very um, attractive to communities where, like Northwest Arkansas, where there's a run up in home prices and there's a real concern about folks of more modest uh, incomes having the availability to access that new housing. And so by way of talking about uh, inclusionary housing, I wanted to mention the program in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, theirs is called the uh, Moderately Priced Dwelling Unit Program. As you may know, it's the oldest inclusionary housing program in the country. It was started in the early 70s. And um, it it's a mandatory program. Every new housing development has to provide housing that's affordable to lower uh, income households. And so uh, if, uh, to look at the specifics, 12.5% of all new housing in all new developments must be offered to households who earn between 60 and 70% of the area median income. Uh, and uh, the county has made other uh, policy changes to land use and zoning to help facilitate um, housing development. They offer density bonuses. If a developer offers greater than 12.5% affordability, there's a density bonus um, that is targeted around areas close to transit and jobs. And so there's uh, an additional incentive to provide more affordable housing. The county reduced um, the requirements for parking uh, at transit adjacent uh, locations so that the cost of development, again, uh, was reduced, making it easier to deliver housing that was uh, available to lower income households. Uh, similar to the uh, streamlining process, the SMART uh, process that Garner mentioned, there's a green taping development review process that expedites the approvals and permitting process for housing that includes affordable, for developments that include affordable housing, which is almost all of them, uh, and also reduces some permitting fees and some other, develop, some other fees associated with development in order to facilitate uh, new housing. So mandatory program. 40 plus years. Just last year, Montgomery County Maryland decided to take a very close look at its inclusionary program and, and is making significant changes, recognizing that the conditions on the ground are quite different than they were 40 years ago. So they're um, looking for um, ways to better meet the housing needs in the community by introducing more flexibility in the program and by uh, really um, incorporating input from the development community because that's who's building the housing, right? To make sure that as these new parameters were be putting into place that the economics on the ground were being taken into account. So I'll just leave you by sort of um, on that issue of inclusionary housing that there's lots of different ways to think about it and that um, going back to this idea of authenticity, um, thinking about how you design particular programs, well, it's, well, whether it's inclusionary housing or a public land program or uh, property tax exemption programs, really has to reflect the housing market conditions on the ground as well as the, the needs in the local community. And there's lots of different variability. So when we talk about these policies and programs over the course of the day, I'm sure you'll pick up that there's no one way to do any of these things. And so thinking about how, what kinds of options are out there and figuring out how to tailor it best to uh, meet your goals, your principles, your values, your needs is really, I think, sort of the order of the day. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that and I think turn it back over to Marty and appreciate uh, the opportunity again. Thanks so much. Okay, so you guys have been a great audience. Now it's your turn to ask a few questions. We're going to set up for our, our panel discussion here in a moment. Uh, as we're doing that, what questions do you have 
for Lisa and Garner. It's hard for me to see. Raise your hand and shout it out, and I'll repeat it back. Yes. Hold on. Possible strategy. Hi, uh, I'm David Cox. I'm a local architect. And you mentioned that one of the possible strategies that could be adopted for Northwest Arkansas was to make public lands available for housing. So I assume you're talking specifically about land that might be owned by the city of Fayetteville. Um, could you elaborate a little bit about how that land would be available? Would it be sold? Would, there be, would it be leased? Um, just elaborate a little bit about how, how you see that strategy being adopted. Is, is this mic on? Yes. Um, it could be uh, all of the above. The, the, um, Austin's looking really broadly in terms of public land, and the city council has actually passed a, a resolution saying that no public land will be sold that isn't used to create affordable housing or attainable housing. So whether or not the land is suitable for housing, the, the proceeds from that land sale go to uh, the housing fund. So it will always, they're, they're pretty adamant about it. If you think broadly, there are vacant, uh, vacant, not vacant, but surface parking lots around the region in Fayetteville and elsewhere. There are old school buildings that are in public ownership. Um, there are county uh, properties. Um, if the school district is like uh, Texas school districts, they frequently land bank, and uh, you can partner, or the city can partner. Of course, the, uh, the biggest successful project is the Miller Airport, which is a huge, uh, huge property under the city's ownership and it was carefully negotiated and it's just a wonderful place. The other thing I didn't mention about Austin housing is the uh, success story. I know they're not keeping up with demand and yesterday they were touted as um, not an example, but they do some things very well. One is that all, all the smart housing and all the blueprint housing is, is, is combined market rate and affordable. The four votes generally below 30 percent. Just ahead. on that note, too, this idea of uh, land owned by the county, the city, the school district. Also, like we often think it has to be vacant, but this idea of thinking about how when you redevelop a fire station, a police station, a library, a community center, how to think about using that opportunity to introduce housing into the redevelopment. Uh, there's really good examples of libraries that have incorporated it with senior housing in particular. Uh, there's really good examples in, in where I live in the city of Alexandria where they've put housing above a fire station. They figured out the design that needed to be put into place to make sure that it wasn't too loud for residents. So it doesn't have to be vacant land, no. certainly underutilized uh, land or redeveloped parcels. Other questions? Uh, we've you've been hearing a lot about diversity and community in the framework of affordability making the houses accessible. Um, but I'm wondering about accessibility structurally. You mentioned senior housing and a library and so forth. Because we're on the front end of a permanent demographic change in the United States, we're going to have 20 to 30 percent of our population over 65. And with public funding, we can't afford to build housing for all of those people. They will have to age in place, most of them. So I'm wondering, from your experience with your planning and the things that you've seen, the innovative things that you've seen, how people are addressing that elsewhere. Tell the folks who you are. Oh, I'm Beth Barham, and I'm working on a project with League of Women Voters uh, for lifelong housing. Yeah, so that's such an important question. I'm a, I was a demographer for a long time, and the, the thing about the needs for housing for older adults is there's no reason for us to be surprised about the needs for housing for older. We are getting older every single year. You can see it happening, right? So we shouldn't be surprised. And the question to your, to your question is, what are we doing to plan for what we know will be a, a coming growth in housing needs for seniors? And so I'll, I'll mention three things briefly. The, um, you know, this idea of, I've worked with communities where they're trying to really systematically evaluate what those needs are, such that when there's new housing being built, that a certain share of that is uh, built as accessible units, and that there's an education with the development community 
about what that means. There's fear that if you build units that have accessibility features, you'll have trouble marketing them and they'll be left vacant. And so getting that education out there is really important. But on the um, aging in place issue, which as you mentioned, that's where most people will be as they age, I think uh, this idea of uh, missing middle housing that was mentioned in land use changes to allow people to age in place is really important. So two examples include uh, policies that promote and maybe even incentivize the creation of accessory units uh, that are located on the same lot as a single family home. And then maybe a little bit more controversial and been harder to uh, get to consensus in the communities that I've worked with is allowing single family homes to be divided out. And so it's that you can create two apartments to allow for one level living that might be a senior household and then a family member or a caregiver that can live within the, the unit on a second. So basically increasing the density technically, right? Because now you have two housing units. Um, but so those are two examples. Uh Northwest Arkansas, near as I can tell, is all about active living, and seniors want to uh, remain active. I, I see there's huge, there are huge possibilities of taking these uh, cruise ship type assisted living centers and breaking them up in finer grain communities. Uh, I just see it a natural for Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I think there, there are some models of co-housing that would be attractive to seniors also. But um, I think we're going to see that continuum uh, shift uh, to more active living for, for elderly rather than warehousing them. Other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Lisa, I'll come over there while, uh, while I'm heading over there with the micro. Z, you can shout it out and we'll repeat it. Uh, can you explain the land trust concept? Can you explain the land trust concept? Uh, a land trust, as Austin is talking about, um, I don't believe they've created it yet, uh, but they're wanting to uh, create a nonprofit uh, organization. They, they're wanting to solicit private um, as well as um, foundation money. Uh, public could put money into it. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, since I've been here, I've been reading the Arkansas statutes, and our, uh, there was a constitutional amendment in year 2000, and there was, there were, the legislature passed a statute to implement it, and it's, I think it's gotten a bad name because it's, it, it allows TIF, but it's much broader than that. Um, I think that community development law could help um, local governments um, work uh, with, in partnerships uh, with nonprofits, and uh, could it actually, I think, even even move into the um, land trust issue. Uh, it allows eminent domain, but you certainly don't have to use eminent domain. You don't have to use TIF. And if uh, if you're not familiar, there's a national organization called Grounded Solutions, sort of the greatest source for information on community land trusts that I'm that I'm aware of, and actually do a lot of technical assistance on the ground, but just have a, a great uh, number of resources on on land trusts. That question came from Zara Clayton Niederman, our local developer for good. Other questions? I'm going to have finish up with a couple, two questions, one for each of you. All right, we'll start uh, with Lisa. Tell me, what is the one thing? <laughs> yeah, the one thing that we can do. You've been here for a couple of hours. The one thing we can do <laughs> to improve the financial opportunities for this accessible housing. So I don't, I've been here for two hours, so the, um, so, That's a couple. No, that's, that's right, it's been 24 hours. So, you know, I think the one thing that I see that helps um, create uh, the opportunity to bring financial resources to build affordable workforce housing is the um, predictability of the process and the availability of resources at the point in time in the development approval the development process where it's hard to get resources. So if there's a local funding source that can do pre-development or pre-pre-development or provide the gap financing that it's difficult to get from other uh, sort of uh, more mainstream sources, then that will provide the right kind of leverage to make sure that the development is able to take advantage of other resources that might not come to the project if it doesn't see those other, there's harder to place financial pieces in place. Garner, your one question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to switch the question on you. Uh, your one question is, what's the one thing that we can change in our planning program to make this possible, to enhance our opportunities for accessible housing? One thing. 
Um, I would say um, um, find ways to allow a variety of housing types in all neighborhoods. Well, that would be a change. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes, we're going to bring up the panelists. Are they going to stay for the panel, too? Stay. Oh, good. So you guys, we're not done with you yet. Good, okay. All right, so. So they get to answer other things, too, then, with the panel. Let's go ahead and bring, convene our panel, then. If the panelists would join us at the stage. Uh, Michael Ward from Flyer Homes Real Estate. Uh, Bob Hunt from Arkansas Development Finance Authority. Peyton Parker, Black Bear Holdings Real Estate, and a Springdale Planning Commissioner. Uh, Brenda Anderson uh, with Northwest Arkansas Downtown Revitalization Fund. Jeremy Hudson, Specialized group, uh, Real Estate Group, Local ULI Chapter. Welcome panelists. Now, I think the way we'll do this is we will just share microphones. Uh, if I see any fighting over the microphones, I'll intervene otherwise. Um, so, So you've heard of the single, uh, the, the, the planning and finance questions. I'm going to still walk down the line just to let the panelists introduce themselves to our community here and, and give us your sense of what the one thing we ought to do. Uh, we ought to do to make these, uh, just as we start our conversation. And I'm not going to dictate every question here. I think you can talk amongst yourself as we move forward. Uh, one thing that I think is important, uh, I know there's a lot of focus on, on how we enable affordable and attainable new construction. Um, but, but uh, and that is certainly needed uh, because we know our population growth. Uh, but a lot of our towns have uh, actually, actually a whole lot of uh, lowercase a uh, attainable workforce housing, but the problem is uh, the neighborhoods in the, that they're in, and I don't necessarily mean that from a, from a crime perspective or anything, but they're just, they're not the types of places that people wanna live because they're, they're not mixed use. Uh, they don't have different housing types in them or they're, they're not walkable at all. So I think one thing we really need to think about is how do we retrofit those neighborhoods, those suburban areas uh, to, to create the lifestyle um, that people want because it's a huge, uh, there's, there's a whole lot of assets out there uh, and that can actually cost a, a whole lot less money uh, sometimes in these new construction. Because when I look at my projects, if I just could wave a magic wand and if I had free land and no impact fees and no architecture fees, you're still, you know, you're stripping, and even if you kind of took our lug some of our luxury stuff and dumbed that down a little bit, you know, you're, you're maybe gonna cut 30% of the budget. Um, and so uh, if a $1,000, uh, you know, studio apartment now is, is $700, that's still not going to, it's still not going to work. The audience can't see your name tag, so please tell sure, them who you sorry. are. Sorry. Jeremy Hudson with Specialized Real Estate Group and also part of the local uh, ULI leadership chapter. Okay, hand it down. We'll, we'll work through the ranks and then we'll come back and be more general. Go ahead. Um, I think the one thing, as I think about our, our region, that we need is we need to identify and support leaders who see uh, affordable and attainable housing as an issue for our region, as an important issue for our region. And then I think that should be manifest in the types of plans and, uh, and programs and regulations that we put forward in our community. Uh, I'm Peyton Parker. I'm a planning commission member in Springdale. And so I'll talk uh, from my viewpoint in Springdale. Uh, I think what, we, what I would dream for is being able to educate the people of Springdale um, that multifamily and mixed, you know, mixed use and missing middle is not bad. And we've, we've had really bad examples of it in Springdale, and there was a moratorium on basically multifamily, it seemed like, for a while. So it's, it's just a struggle and a fight every week, every month at the meetings, you know, people still think that multifamily equals crime, yeah, you know, and, and so I, I don't know how to do it other than just being an advocate for it, but, but educating everybody um, in the community, I think, is really important. I'm Michael Ward of Flyer Real Estate, and I also work with the nonprofit development group Partners for Better Housing. Um, I'm going to start by stating the obvious that the one thing we can do is to adopt as many of these things as possible. 
Um, but I want to emphasize the, the neighborhood component. Um, I think a really valuable planning tool would be to implement a more node, nodal type of development um, for neighborhoods, so creating these types of community focal points that uh, next to or part of a single family neighborhood um, and following a type of uh, urban village concept within a town. Hi, I'm Bob Hunt with the Development Finance Authority and the thing I'd like to stress or the one thing that I would like to uh, talk about is if y'all have an idea about developing low income or affordable housing, the Development Finance Authority is the state agency for funding. We're the allocator for 9% tax credits, 4% tax credits. Uh, we have the HUD home grant. Uh, we have other buckets of money that go into funding these projects. So and another thing would be to build capacity in Northwest Arkansas. Probably before this year, we had one development partner up here. And I think over the past six months, we've been working with a couple others trying to get projects started. There is a long lead time, but building capacity in the, in the local area to look for projects that are affordable that meet these needs is something that I'd like to emphasize. Bob, I hope you brought a lot of business cards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to challenge the panel to address the issue of transportation. I'm not going to pick on anyone, uh, but let's talk about transportation. What do you think, uh, and I won't pick on anyone but Garner, what do you think our most important first steps in changing our thinking about transportation should be? Because what I've heard from yesterday and today is there's a nexus. Yeah, you're passing it off. Uh, <laughs> what's, the, what's the most important first step we need to be thinking about in terms of rethinking our transportation corridor, transportation strategy, transportation infrastructure investment in this uh, Missouri to the Boston Mountain region? Just uh, educating the public about the benefits of shortening trips. We, uh, us planners talk too much about walking and people get tired walking and riding bikes and it's cold outside and it's hot outside. But I've never met anybody that wanted to do a long trip to go to the grocery store. So the, the first step I think for this region is to emphasize that there are huge, huge benefits uh, to shortening trips. And once we do that mixed use and shorten trips, it also becomes more walkable and it also works for transit. Yeah. Well, just, just to add two things to that. So I think it's also good to tell people that you're not forcing them out of their cars. Like, I think some people worry about that. You're making me walk. You're making me have to take transit. But someone from the someone told me, because I'm, I'm a driver, so, so in a very transit accessible region, I'm a driver. And someone told me, well, it's good for drivers, too, for there to be options for folks who don't want to drive. So it's good to have options. Another thing I'll mention, just to build on what you said, is as this planning process goes forward, doing the transportation, the land use, and the housing planning all together, where people are all in the same room at the same time, don't forget to bring schools into the conversation. Because when it comes to new housing, traffic, and schools, right? And so if you have schools there at the beginning, you can start to answer some of the concerns that people have similar to traffic um, and transportation. You, who else would like to comment on the transportation challenge as we look at the transportation housing nexus? Um, in our community, we're on the back side of a comprehensive planning process, going to be finishing up in the next few months. And um, when we look at drafts, there's a transportation plan, there's the land use plan, there are different chapters, there's not really a housing plan per se. I guess I'm just wondering about what a plan looks like that um, integrates those issues together and that then creates metrics so that we can understand as we make land use decisions how a location or a site is um, transportation positive or negative. Well, the um, Imagine Austin process was a values driven process. And what I mean by that is we went out and had 5,000 people tell us what the challenges were and the opportunities were and that set, that set the theme for the plan. And the challenges and opportunities were transportation and affordability, as well as protecting the natural environment and the other components of the plan. 
But when you start with a values-driven process rather than element-driven, I've done the old plans, and they're no fun at all, um, you, you know, where you focus on utilities and then you focus on land use, and, and, uh, and then you get sort of a dry document. Um, but I think if you go ask, ask your citizens, what are their values? What are their hopes? What, are, what challenges do they see? Um, what are their goals? And then you respond to that, you'll, you will get an integrated plan. Lisa provided a spectrum of engagement motivators for developers. And I was fascinated by that spectrum. I'm interested in our, from our local panelists, which, uh, where do we fit on that spectrum now and what needs to change in order to engage more development in this market? Jeremy, you're first. <laughs> you're on. Um, well, I mean, I would say uh, the, put me on the spot here, I'll try to be That's my job. politically correct. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of really good positive discussion around a lot of those items, but I think the vast majority of those, you know, have not been implemented. Um, thankfully, from a planning perspective, uh, most if not all of the major cities are, are adopting the right plans. Uh, they're thinking the right way from a zoning perspective, uh, but just like we're not, uh, for the most part, integrating those transportation and housing plans, uh, we're not integrating for the the, the economic development um, with the with the real estate development and the zoning, and so you you end up with these um, these master plans and zoning codes that that um, they encourage the right development or they uh, allow the right type of de development, but there's no uh, incentive one way or the other to develop uh, the type of projects or the, the the right locations versus greenfield development that's moving in the wrong direction. Kind of a tough one. I'm with you, Jeremy, but I, I think um, there's a couple of things, and one of them sets around um, not just the plans themselves, but then the process. And and so many times, I think our plans try to be economically neutral. They um, are hesitant. Um, the policies that come out of those plans are hesitant to take a position or to. Um, state that, hey, we as a community are going to say this is a need and we're going to provide incentives to move in a positive direction to address this need. Uh, they tend to be much more reliant on uh, market forces. Um, and I think um, as communities we have to begin to um, understand the public sector role in um, addressing the need and, and harness that power in a more productive way? Um, financing. I would love to get more financing. Um, so the part of downtown Springdale that I live in, um, I think like 8% have a bachelor's degree and the median income is $35,000. So I would love not only financing or access to capital for developers, but for the people that live in downtown Springdale so that they can do these AUDs or, you know, fix up their own properties and, you know, kind of get invested in it and also build something, you know, build something nice instead of kind of trying to drive it from a market force because there's places in downtown Springdale that people are not looking to build and, you know, lease, but the people down there could really use projects that they could generate income, maybe do a little bit more small scale development in those areas. Uh, Mike, uh, Michael, I'm really interested in your perspective. Uh, you are with uh, Flyer Homes Real Estate, so do you, th do you see the market demand for these homes? Um, I see a market demand, especially in Fayetteville, across the board for quality houses under $200,000, $250,000. That's a pretty significant gap that's not being well met. Um, again, that's single family. I primarily focus on residential real estate. Um, however, there is also the huge demand to live near amenities or live in core areas, um, whether it's homeowners or renters, and there's a serious lack of units, particularly in Fayetteville, particularly in Bentonville. We're seeing the changes in Rogers, and I would 
presume, even though Springdale is in its early phase of downtown redevelopment, we can probably anticipate similar changes in Springdale. Um, so there's a need for it across the board. And making those city lands available would be a huge step in the right direction. Um, yeah, Garner, I, I'm afraid that that particular, uh, you, you popped some eyes open pretty big with that uh, opportunity for discussion. And as he emphasized, there are all kinds of ways to do it. Um, and then another thing that would help in core areas is to reduce or remove parking minimum requirements um, for, for multifamily projects. And Expand allow, on that. Uh, just allow, we, Fayetteville's already done it for commercial projects. The idea is simply you allow the developer, the lender, the market essentially to determine what uh, they think the parking need is to make their project work. And if you're in a well-served core area, um, theoretically your transit need, or your parking needs are less. Um, so parking minimum requirements are somewhat arbitrary and they, they challenge your site design too, which reduce density, so. Bob, I'm a developer. I'm not, but if I were, I want to come to you to, to develop 40 acres um, and I've got a, a financial strategy and even uh, some level of, of, of competency. What's next? I think the next step is to figure out what funding source you're going after. How many units are gonna be on the property? Uh, because inside of that, there's different ways to attack building affordable housing. Um, one common thing is the use of low income housing tax credits. Uh, there's two basic types, 9% uh, and 4%. And say you're building a, our standard 9% project is probably between 40 and 60 units, uh, multifamily. But if you wanna go bigger, something huge density, you would use a 4% tax credit. But one thing that's important is access to land for developers. Because inside of the tax credits, tax credits will go to help subsidize the cost of construction. Putting in the foundation, two by fours roofing, but tax credits do not go into subsidizing the land cost. So with affordable housing, the land cost has to be paid for by the rents. So if you have very high land cost, the rents can't be affordable and fall under the LIHTC guidelines for rent. Fascinating, you can imagine the consequences. You go where the land is cheap, that's radial development, right? All right, so now let's bring this back a little bit. We've still got a couple of minutes. We'll be, we'll be having lunch in about 15 minutes. Um, as we anticipate um, developing with this pattern, let's assume in five years, 10 years, we've built an infrastructure in our community to be successful in, in, uh, in addressing this challenge. And we have a lot more uh, younger families with school-aged children living within uh, the core of our community. How do we address the issue of, of centralized school systems for primary secondary education? Because we're losing them. Well, right, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's, uh, like all, I think what I've been so interested to hear about is this idea of envisioning what kind of community we wanna be in the future. And so the issue you raised may not be in front of us now, this issue of the need for more schools or for different schools in different locations, but it's kind of like the housing needs for the older population. You can see it's coming. So why not plan for it now? That would mean we'd be intentional. <laughs> well, right, and bringing, and bringing the school's facility planning process in with the land use and the transportation and the housing planning process and to figure out what the schools of the future will look like as well as what the neighborhoods of the future will look like. And it means taking a little bit of a leap, right? Because you're starting to think that people are going to live differently. Families are gonna live maybe differently in the future than they are uh, maybe now or in the past. So thinking about an urban school may be a different way of thinking because you're used to building the schools out in the greenfield areas where all the housing has been built. So being open to new design of schools is actually kind of an exciting thing to think about. The, um, we are just building in our pretty urbanized area the first 
um, two-story elementary school. This was a very strange thing for people to think about, that kids have to walk upstairs to go to their classroom. Well, kids can walk upstairs to go to their classroom. But, but this idea, but it allowed them to sort of double the amount of classroom space on the same piece of land. And so I think bringing the school's folks into the process while you're visioning what the community is going to look like seems to be essential, right? And that the school, the student body and the families and the folks who live here in 10 years may look different and might have different sort of uh, types of kids and different kinds of um, places that they're living. So I think your mantra is demographics are destiny. Demographics are, and it's, you can see it. Yeah, it's not magic, is not it? Magic. Uh, Two quick thoughts. Um, uh, you mentioned I started working in Lawrence, Kansas and Lincoln, Nebraska. They both uh, had way back tradition of working with their school districts to site their schools uh, when the land is developed. And I, um, I worked there for a couple of decades and I thought that's why, what everybody did. And then I went to Colorado and they didn't do it that way. But the other point is we need to do that again. Um, the other point is schools don't have to be, you don't have to have 50 acres for a high school and 25 acres for a middle school and 10 acres for an elementary school. That's bogus and we need to rethink it. Uh, no, you don't get, the, get away that quick. <laughs> so you, you just put a challenge on the floor, rethinking our whole school system. Where do we start with that conversation? Um, go over and, and uh, meet the superintendent and, and uh, this, the school board. And you work for the city of Fayetteville. I do. Is that happening? Uh, it sounds like it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. And, and get the communities involved and engaged in that kind of project. I mean, if in South Fayetteville, for example, is a growing, changing community, if you get the parents involved and believe in it, you know, encourage them and say, all right, we need your help. Go to these school board meetings. And in a year of school board meetings, everyone's going and saying the same thing over and over. We might see some changes. So we address the financial challenge for the developer. And perhaps we have at least acknowledged the financial challenge for the homeowner. We've addressed, at least acknowledged the challenge with transportation to make these uh, homes not just accessible financially, but accessible from a quality of life perspective, both from the elderly and the, and the, uh, the younger family community. What's, and we've also now addressed education. What other are the next critical amenities that we're gonna have to have as we rethink our communities? I would, I would add, I mean, this has already been talked about, but I mean, I think um, we have to be very uh, purposeful in our focus, not just on the existing downtowns and the existing cores. Those are huge and we have to, we have to figure out how to get uh, more attainable and affordable housing within the core to support what's here. Uh, but not everybody in Northwest Arkansas is gonna live or work in a downtown. And we're, you know, we're always going to have, and we're blessed to have anchor institutions, and that's going to, that is going to require commutes and transportation. But I think, just like we're thinking about housing, we need to think about uh, those those other uses, particularly where people are going to be working in office space uh, and other uh, neighborhood services. And, and as Michael mentioned, we've got to think about that, uh, those those neighborhood nodes and those uh, neighborhood center-based developments. Um, and I think that there. That will enable us to maybe have a broader conversation. Uh, you know, right now, if you took a, to a poll of everybody in here, we'd probably all, uh, you know, vote for or, or at least an overwhelming majority for improving downtowns and spending infra infrastructure and transportation dollars downtown because we're believers in downtown. But there's uh, a, va a majority of the population of all four or our five of our major cities um, that would feel like they're getting. Uh, you know, left out of that conversation. But if we start thinking about how do we retrofit uh, other other neighborhood centers and other parts to to have jobs, to have offices, to have uh, you know neighborhood scale uh, uh, amenities, uh, grocery stores, and shops, then I think we be begin to engage a much broader broader base. I, I would like to I would like to see cities maybe shift their spending for the planning, our planning department. Our planning department, I don't feel like they get to do a lot of planning. Um, and it puts a strain on them because they're meeting with developers. It's a lot of it ends up being reactionary. And, you know, it, I, I do feel strongly that it starts with the plan. You know, we're doing the land use plan right now in the northwest quadrant of Springdale. Currently, 
all single family SF2, the entire section. And, you know, back to the point about mixed use and not even necessarily mixed use in a single structure, but not making it so that single families out here and that the closest Walmart you have to get all the way down through there. But it's tough to get that plan, that solid plan, and get the community feedback and all that, and just keep up with the boom that's going on right now. So, you know. Things are changing under our feet fast. Speaking of changing, we're gonna pivot now to you. What questions do you have for our panel? Oh, we got one right up front. Introduce yourself, John. Uh, I'm John Anderson. Uh, a lot of states have uh, strict minimum requirements on school siting, so many acres for elementary, junior high, high school. Others have uh, recommended uh, uh, siting. In, in California, I was talking to somebody in the state architect's office that uh, really had her back up over the idea that they had some recommended sizes, but every community and school board seemed to be taking those recommendations as minimums, and that was not what they intended, and someday she was gonna give somebody a piece of her mind. Um, is Arkansas set up under the you must have five acres, or we think five acres is a good idea, y'all work it out? I think it's a recommendation. I, I, You're looking at me, Peyton. I haven't a clue. <laughs> uh, well, we've had this discussion because, you know, part of the planning, too, is with the schools. I mean, development happens where the schools are at. So, uh, and, and Springdale, we buy 20-acre, 30-acre tracks, and so... But I, I, I recall, I think it's just a, a suggestion. We, we, we have schools in Springdale that are not. You know, they're on smaller, they're older, but they're on smaller. We do too. Lots. In Fayetteville. Uh, well, um, back to uh, Lincoln and Lawrence, they always combined the school with a neighborhood park. Yeah. And so they shared uh, athletic facilities, which was, uh, it's just common sense. <laughs> I don't, I don't know the answer to the specific question, but I mean, I do know that um, for the most part, my experience uh, just in observing um, how our school boards are making those decisions are, you know, they're making them completely autonomously, I think, um, and they're not, and they may be thinking about their cost of how, you know, how, how, how much does it cost them to operate a facility, uh, and, and their guidelines are teaching them that they need those uh, larger land masses, but there's no consideration, I don't think, given to what, you know, what does that do to the city overall? What does that do uh, to the cost of transportation or the cost of, of, of utilities? Uh, and they're either being reactive to uh, a developer saying, hey, I've got this big piece of property and I want you to put a you know, school here, or um, they are, um, in, 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 in a lot of cases, we, we do have the benefit. We've got some school boards that are thinking long-term, but, but unfortunately, they're thinking long-term uh, with a mindset of maybe a generation ago and, and following development patterns that have happened over the last 20 years, and they're going out to the outskirts uh, of town and, and finding property, which then drives residential development. Melissa, go ahead and shout it out, and I'll repeat it. Hold on, You're, this is going to be longer than I can repeat. <laughs> Sorry. Tell who you are. Okay. My name is Melissa Terry. I live in South Fayetteville, and I'm on the Fayetteville Housing Authority Board um, and a public policy graduate student. Um, so the cool thing is, is that we're circling back to things that we knew, but we forgot, but we we're remembering. And in South Fayetteville, we have Jefferson Elementary, a two-story school attached to an urban park in a neighborhood that's up and coming and rapidly de developing. And I like the way that Michael was describing the urban village concept because as a social anchor, a school drives development, right? And so when the school district moved the population that used to attend walkable Jefferson Elementary, they moved those students by design to justify the building of a new construction school way out on the perimeter in the middle of a pasture. And so now all these schools' kids are bused to West Fayetteville. My question is to you guys, we talked about engagement motivators for developers. So what I'm hearing and what Jeremy's touching on 
is what are the engagement motivators for engaging with the school board and engaging with the residents who historically have used this school as a social anchor and a walkable um, piece of infrastructure that was vital to the soul of this neighborhood? We have scars. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. What do you think? The, especially our, uh, this was a discussion yesterday, how do, we, how do we be authentic? How do we engage people in the community who don't just show up, uh, who are otherwise busy with their lives, typically very busy with their the process of making a living and raising their kids? I can't answer that question, but I would ask another question to follow that up, uh, and maybe Garner could help answer this with, with your past experience. But I would assume that a big uh, decision uh, factor for a school district, uh, besides the land cost, is is the infrastructure cost. And I would guess, uh, again, uh, typically, probably cities have provided those to them, thinking that that was the right thing to do. Uh, and so I would think that the city, uh, with its transportation utility dollars, potentially has a big uh, a, a big motivator there. You're absolutely right. The um, uh, infrastructure was installed in Lincoln. Um, it, it was a neighborhood planning concept. It started with Clarence Perry at the beginning of the 20th century. And the uh, first comprehensive plan for um, Lincoln was done by a guy named Harlan Bartholomew, who, who lived to be 103 years old and died happily in his sleep. But he left Lincoln in a much better place, and he put he he brought all those neighborhood planning ideas uh, to Lincoln. They were there when I started working there, uh, and they're still going. They they've been refined. Uh, they've done a lot with allowing different types of housing. But um, yes, traditionally, the the town or the developer built the streets, um, and the developer often. Uh, dedicated the land for the school, uh, which is an entry into the door with the school district. And I suspect that's happening in Fayetteville, too. I, I have been here long enough, but yes, uh, yes. developers usually want an elementary school. Yeah. One more comment, and then we'll, we'll do the... I mean, Melissa touches on the age-old challenge of advocacy, I suppose, um, and organizing residents. And adopting the alternative to a NIMBY attitude, which call it YIMBY, you know? Yes, we want an urban school in our neighborhood that's changing, and just, you gotta show up. You gotta show up at the board meetings, you gotta bring people together, and you know, you know advocacy better than most people I know, and to me, that's, that's the way you really enforce that kind of political change, because it's, a reflection of deeply entrenched just social and political processes that push schools to the edges, push neighborhoods to the edges, and deplete urban cores. I mean, we, we know that history. Now we're in the process of changing it, and I do believe urban schools are a really critical element of that. Thank you, guys. All right, so the good news is we have two more rounds of case studies with lots of opportunity for further discussion on many of these issues. Let's thank our panelists.